Okay, hey everyone, thanks for joining. Don't worry, take some time finding your seats. All right, we'll get started. Um, my name is Nico, Nicolas Oliveira. I'm going to talk about executors. I spent the uh, better part of the last year working on executors, so there's lots to talk about. Um, first, a little bit about me. Why am I here? Why am I qualified to talk to you? So chiefly, I'm an Airflow committer. That's the main hat I'm wearing at uh, this summit. I've been in the Airflow community for two and a half years. Uh, I think my first contribution was in June 2021, something like that. Um, but I'm also a senior engineer at Amazon. Um, I used to work in the marketplace side of Amazon, so on the Amazon.ca website. But uh, in the middle of my career, I moved over to manage workflows for Apache Airflow. You guys have probably heard of it, MWA. I helped build and uh, launch and GA that product. But then after that, I was a founding member of the open source team. So at Amazon, we actually have a crew of us uh, paid by Amazon to work entirely in public, so we write our code on GitHub. Uh, it's pretty awesome. We're a team of seven now. It started with just me and, inter and an intern a while ago. Dennis, if you're in the crowd here, uh, go say hi to him. Um, and like I said, I spent much of the last year working on Airflow executors, so that's what we're going to talk about. First, we're going to do a little bit of a, an explainer on what an executor is. I know most of you are familiar with Airflow, but we'll just cover the basics really quickly. Um, and I'm surprised some people have some misconceptions too. Um, so the scheduler decides when to run a task, that's its primary job, and then the executor decides how to run a task. It doesn't always execute it itself, sometimes it defers it to an external service, um, but that's kind of the interplay between the two. The scheduler regularly heartbeats the executor and they interact with each other over an API. Uh, the executor itself, some people are often confused what that thing is and where it lives. Like, is it an airflow process, is it its own service? Um, it's something much more simple, actually. You know, it's just a Python class, a set of modules um, instantiated by the scheduler, and the scheduler interacts with it over a, a set of methods. Um, so the executors are pluggable. You can write your own. They were always somewhat pluggable, but there were some issues that we've improved, and uh, we have some more slides on that uh, in the future. Um, so we'll speak more of that. There's three major types of executors. There's more and you could chop them up more finely, but uh, these are the three main groups that are gonna be useful for this talk. Uh, the first is local executors. So tasks are actually executed on the host that the executor is living on. And again, the executor is inside the scheduler, so this would execute wherever your scheduler is running. Um, so an example of that is the local executor. I'm sure a lot of you have run into that one. It's one of the first ones people use when they start playing around with Airflow. It's really convenient to set up. It's quick and easy to run. Uh, it's fairly fast because the tasks are executed locally. You don't have any network requests. Um, but also, you know, you're using the same resources as the scheduler, um, so it's limited in that capacity. Another one is remote executors, and this specifically remote batch or queued. Uh, the celery executor is an example that most people are familiar with here. Um, so it's more robust because you've now decoupled the executor work from where the scheduler lives. You have workers who are listening to some queue, waiting for tasks to arrive, and the executor is sending tasks off to that queue. Um, so you have uh, often parallel workers, a lot of things listening to the queue. Workers themselves can run more than one task, which is uh, very beneficial. But you also have some downplays. You're paying for these new hosts now, if, especially if they're persistent listening to that queue. That's a cost. And you also have multiple tasks running on one worker. Uh, and so you can get some noisy neighbor problems. You're sharing CPU, you're sharing memory, um, and those can complicate things uh, in the future. And one of the last ones is a containerized remote executor. So Kubernetes is the main example here. A lot of you are familiar with that as well, I'm sure. So tasks are executed inside containers or pods ad hoc. So the scheduler decides a task should run, hands it off to the executor. The executor starts a pod, runs the task, and then the container is torn down after the task uh, exits. So there's a lot of pros to these. You have uh, no noisy neighbor problem because each task is safely inside its own container, so its own CPU, its own memory. You can customize the environment for these tasks, which is super helpful. So you can build in specific system libraries, binaries, data that you need in the image. Um, that's all very helpful. Uh, it's cost effective because the compute's only living for the time that the task is running, so that's another big benefit. Um, but also there are some SLA issues. So it takes a while to start up that container for each task, so that doesn't have a zero cost. Uh, and you also don't have persistent workers, which is nice, but now you're also managing a Kubernetes cluster, which is easy, not impossible, but it's also not free. 
Um, so executors, like I mentioned before, implement what we call the base executor class. And this represents the public interface. Um, if you wanted to write your own executor, this is what you would subclass. It was always possible to write your own executor, like I mentioned earlier, but there were two main issues. One is this class, we didn't make any promises about it. Airflow has done a lot of work recently, actually, about um, strictly saying what we consider is public and what we consider private, um, and making more promises about that code. And the second issue, which is possibly the bigger one, um, where there was many executor features uh, that were baked into the Airflow core code base rather than the executor interface. And we call this executor coupling. And here is an example of coupling. So this is a snippet from the Airflow backfill job. Don't have to worry about what that is. Uh, this is also about DAG pickling. You also don't have to worry about what that is. It's not important. But here you can see that there's three executors here, hard-coded in the Airflow code base. So if you have self do not, not pickle, this is double negative. It's not my code. Don't get mad at me. Uh, and the self executor class is one of these, then pickle, uh, otherwise not. So this is, this is not great, right? So the number one thing you need to ask yourself if you uh, think you see executor coupling is if you wanted to write your own executor that supported feature X, say pickling, would you have to cut a PR to the Airflow code base to add your executor? If you do, that's bad. That's a code smell. That's executor uh, coupling. So how did we fix this? I wrote an AIP. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with that, but it's an Airflow improvement proposal. Uh, these are proposals for big direction changes in Airflow, architecture changes. Um, so I snooped through the code base and described uh, every instance of executed coupling I could find and possible fixes, suggested fixes, uh, and then went through the AIP process, iterating, reviewing, uh, voting, and once it was passed, I put a community effort together which was awesome. I've made a GitHub project board. I don't know if anyone here is, were uh, committers on that, but that was a super helpful process. I made a task for every coupling, a suggested fix, and us in the community went, uh, went coding and fixed most of them. A lot of them were those compatibility checks that I just showed you uh, for pickling. But some of them were a little bit more, uh, more involved. So CLI commands, for example. Uh, for those of you who use the Celery and Kubernetes executors, you might know that there are Airflow CLI commands for those executors. Uh, and if you wanted to write your own executor that had CLI commands, there was no way to do this. Again, you need to modify the Airflow core code base, uh, which is not ideal. So now there is a robust framework for injecting your own CLI commands if you wrote your own executor. And a few more examples like this. They're not too important to get into, but executors can now ingest uh, or uh, vend task logs. So if your execution environment has some data about how a task was executed that doesn't show up in the Airflow task logs, the executor can now provide those uh, to Airflow, which is a really cool feature. I hope a lot of people make use of that one. So this is what the code looks like now. Same backfill, same pickling, same double negative about do not, not pickle. Um, but now you can see we're just importing the default executor. So as we know, Airflow environments use one executor. Uh, and then we just ask this thing, hey, do you support pickling? And if so, we pickle. And so now Airflow core code doesn't need to know where this executor came from. It doesn't need to know who implemented it. It doesn't need to know what it's called. It just needs to know, hey, do you implement this API, this interface that I know how to communicate with? And if so, we're happy. OK, so what are some of the benefits of this? What are some of the fallouts? Um, so one of the big ones is some of those executors that lived in Airflow, Celery Executor and Kubernetes are two uh, good examples. They don't need to live in that code base anymore. They can happily interact with Airflow over this public interface. They could live anywhere. Um, so they were moved to provider packages. Yark did this work. I'm not sure if he's in the room, but if you see him this weekend, give him a high five for that. Um, it was a big project to move those. A lot of other code changes had to happen. But as part of AAP51, we made those two executors completely AAP compliant. Um, so now they live in their own package. It can be pip installed separately. It can be updated separately. So that's one of the main benefits is provider packages and Airflow can be iterated on faster than the core releases are. And now the core code base is much simpler, right? There's hundreds of line of code uh, that were removed because of that. It just makes that package easier to manage. Uh, another benefit is that it's just easier to write executors now. It's more supported than ever. So that's what myself and uh, the team at Amazon did. So we're working on a new executor, myself and some folks, with initial contribution from Ahmed. If you haven't checked out his repository, it's great. Uh, it's got a list of, 
It's got a list of AWS executors. Some of them are pretty cool. We uh, started with that, made a bunch of changes, a bunch of improvements. Uh, AIP 51 affied everything in there. Um, the pull request is in review right now. So if you wanted to get involved, tell me that you like it or hate it. Uh, these links will be distributed and clickable once the slides are out, but also it's just 34381 uh, pull request if you want to go say hi. Leave a rocket emoji. So this is what the executor looks like. This is the architecture diagram for that. Uh, here's the, imagine this, this is a very simplified diagram, but imagine this is just a host. The scheduler's living on there, the web server process is living on there. You can see the executor interacting with the scheduler. And the ECS executor, you know, ECS is Elastic Container Service, for those of you not familiar. It's a managed container service from Amazon. We communicate over the internet with the ECS API. And a lot of these boxes will look familiar to those familiar with ECS. For those of you not, don't worry about it. Um, the CCES API talks to a cluster using a task definition, which is like a declaration of what your container and your uh, ECS task looks like. Grabs an image from ECR, Docker Hub, wherever you have it hosted, and then launches that inside your AWS networking on ECS Fargate, EC2. And the only minimal requirement is that that uh, networking needs to be able to access your Airflow metadatabase. Um, let's talk, actually, a few more of the benefits. So the ECS executor is a containerized executor like the one we talked about earlier. So it's got those same benefits, which is important to note. So it's that same uh, task isolation, no shared resources, no CPU, no memory, no noisy neighbor problem. Uh, it's got those defined environments. So you can really customize the environment of each executor um, or each task. You can have your own binaries, you know, things that aren't even pip installable. You know, if you have system libs, data you need to be there, binaries, code from your corporate, your company that needs to be in there that isn't uh, publicly installable. It's super helpful for that. Um, again, it's got that cost effectiveness where the task is only living for the life cycle of uh, the airflow task. That makes it nice and cheap. But it's also got the same cons I mentioned uh, earlier as well. Uh, so what's more future work? Uh, we have more executors coming. My team uh, is gonna build a few more, uh, starting with Batch. So Batch is a, uh, another managed Amazon service. It uh, is a queuing framework. So it's compute, but fronted by a queue. So it's very similar to the uh, Celery Executor, for those of you who use that. Um, the compute, again, is backed by EC2, ECS, anything you want to use with ECS, Fargate, EKS. Um, so I think this will be a nice complement to the ECS Executor. It's kind of like Kubernetes and Celery. You'll have ECS and Batch. Uh, and it's, Batch also is very good at auto-scaling, which is something that's difficult to do with Celery. For anyone here that's tried, that's tricky. Uh, it's tricky to get right depending on which broker you're using with Celery. That's a whole other talk, but it's something we've struggled with, and I think this is going to be super useful for that. Um, we're going to work on Amazon EKS Executor. So that's another container-based executor. You know, you might ask, you already have ECS, but, you know, some people love Kubernetes, and you just can't get them off of it. So we want to give you an option to be able to use Kubernetes and keep all your stuff in the AWS infrastructure. Um, so you'll have an executor that runs tasks right in uh, Kubernetes pods using EKS. We have some others coming that I don't want to make promises on. So I'll just say stay tuned. Um, but also we want to hear from you. So come catch me out in the hallway or uh, sometime over the next few days. I'd like to hear what executors you'd like. It doesn't even have to be AWS. My team is from AWS, but we work for the community. So if you all come to me and say there's some service you really want to have an executor for, then we're happy to build it. Just come let us know. Or we can talk in the Q&A as well. Um, one last piece of future work that I'm really excited about that I want to talk about here is the idea of hybrid execution. So we've talked about a bunch of different executors. They all have their own pros and cons. Um, we've gone over them a couple times now. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to use nothing but the pros of those executors? Um, so you have maybe a set of very low latency tasks that are very small. They take a few hundred milliseconds. They're fire and forgets, but you need them to run quickly as soon as they're scheduled. Maybe you want to use a local executor for that. You know, that cheap and easy one that's very slow or very uh, fast SLA. Maybe you have another set of tasks that are still reasonably uh, SLA intensive, you need them to run quickly, but you have a lot of them. You know, you're firing off hundreds of these. You might want to send those to a queued base executor. So you fire off hundreds of tasks at the queue and you have workers ready and waiting to pull those tasks down and run them. Maybe they're okay running alongside each other. Um, maybe you have a few very heavy tasks. You know, they're not safe to run alongside other tasks. Um, so you want them isolated, you want them in a container. Maybe they have um, very specific requirements for the environment. Uh, I think 
this is going to be a very important feature for a lot of people. We've heard people ask for this, um, and we're going to build it. Expect an AIP from us in the future. Uh, at a high level, you should be able to say, here's the default executor for my Airflow environment, you know, and here's the default executor for a DAG. And then right down to the task level, you should be able to decorate the task and say, this specific task I want to run on this executor with this config. Uh, I think that'll be really powerful. There currently are hybrid-ish executors, the Celery Kubernetes executor, the Celery local executor. But those aren't great. They're a little clunky to use. They kind of have the same issues I talked about earlier. Um, there was no promised interface. You know, someone created these eons ago, and they're a little clunky, and they're, they're hacked together in a way for how you decide which executor is used for each task. Um, and also, just the permutation isn't great. You know, we're writing more of these executors, and I hope you folks write more executors. So if we needed to make a concrete class for every combination of executor, uh, it would get a little ridiculous. So we're going to have an AAP. Expect that from us soon, maybe next year. I'd like to hear some feedback maybe in the Q&A and also in the AAP. If you all want to get involved, join the uh, email list for Airflow. And uh, that's all I have. Many questions. All right. Thank you so much, Nico. Thanks, everyone.